you're listening to the STEM XM podcast, highlighting women in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And now, your host, Mel the Engineer. Hi there, and thank you for joining me today on STEM XM. I am your host, Mel the Engineer, and today I've got our very first guest from NASA on the show. NASA is, of course, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States. And our guest today is Dr. Sarah Noble. She is a planetary geologist and lunar scientist. Sarah earned a BS in geology from the University of Minnesota and then went on to earn a PhD in geology from Brown University. She's held many different positions with NASA, and she was also a Congressional Science Fellow shortly after earning her PhD. So take a listen, and I'll be back with you at the end to talk about show notes. Welcome to STEM XM, Sarah Noble. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. So you studied geology in school. Can you talk to us about how you made the decision initially when you're doing your undergraduate work to go into geology? Sure. Um, I I was a space nerd from being a very small child. I was always into space. I was really sort of obsessed with space. Uh, And then I went to college. I started out as an aerospace engineer because it was the only major that had the word space in it. So I figured that's where I belonged. Uh, And I was an engineering major for about a year when it occurred to me that I was not really cut out to be an engineer. Um, I really liked the science better. And so I just sort of started flipping through the course catalog looking for what sparked my interest. And I sort of stumbled into geology that way. And it turns out that 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 was where my tribe was. And and I was immediately in love with geology. Um, And then it was actually several years later when I had some geology professors who knew I was like really into space who were like, you know, Sarah, there's a whole field of geology called planetary geology where you get to study planets. I was like, there's what? And it was fantastic. And And I went, you know, sort of back in the direction of space. Oh my gosh, that's so funny because, you know, I kind of, I did something similar where I thought environment, I want to be environmental, so I'll do environmental engineering. You know, I had this thought. So that, yeah, that's crazy. I had no idea that you could get into space related stuff through geology. So, okay. So talk to us about what your undergraduate work was like, you know, because was the undergraduate work, did it get into the space stuff or was it kind of like basics and then you got to go into space stuff when you did graduate work? How did, how did that play out? Yeah, that's pretty much the deal. I went to the University of Minnesota, which is a great undergrad geology department, and, and it, but it was pretty straightforward geology, although uh, my professors knew that I was into space. So every now and again, they would push me when I was doing, you know, a, a, a paper or whatever. They'd be like, Sarah, what do you what do you think about, you know, how this applies to Mars? And I'd like go off and like, you know, so they were very supportive of that, but I they didn't have the background. They didn't have I didn't have classes in in planetary geology there. Um, it wasn't until grad school that, that I went to a, a place where we had real planetary geology classes. But you know what? I actually think that's sort of better. Um, the best planetary geologists are the ones who have the best footing in geology. Everything we learned about other planets starts with what we know about the Earth. And so it turns out I, I think that that's, that's really the, the, the better path to take is to get that good foundation in terrestrial geology first. Okay, so... You initially weren't familiar with the field of geology. So for other other students out there who may not be familiar with what what that is about, c- could you describe it? So geology is the study of the earth. It's the study of how things work on the earth, you know, whether that's volcanoes and, you know, mountains and lakes and rivers or, um, you know, how the, the rocks around us formed and and evolved over time. Okay. And then it splits off into lots of different sub-disciplines and and planetary geology is one of them. What what are some of the other areas you could go into? Oh, geez. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different directions that geology heads into from sort of, you know, geophysics, studying uh, hazards like earthquakes um, and volcanoes and volcanology. There's the study of rocks themselves, petrology. 
Um, I have a lot of friends who do experimental petrology that make their own rocks in the lab, which I think is really cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, there's hydrogeology uh, study that studies water systems and, and lacustrian geology, oceanography. Um, if you're if you're more into lakes and, and oceans, um, there's there's a lot of geology. And one of the great things about planetary geology is it actually touches on a lot of those different fields, right? Instead of studying volcanoes on the Earth, you study volcanoes on Mars. <laughs> So you found geology, you said in in the student handbook or the the, the, cor- the, the course guide. Yeah, right, I was the, just sort of thumbing through, looking for interesting sounding courses. Yeah. So, so how did you how did you figure out that this was uh, to you, you use your words? How did you figure out that this was your tribe? Well, I started taking classes. I actually switched my major before I even took a single class. But of course, you go and you take you know the intro geology class. Um, and I just, I just loved it. I love the fact that it was so much about the world around you and, and understanding, you know, the rocks beneath your feet and you can, you know, go out and take a walk and see geology everywhere you were and, and try to understand how the world was put together. I mean, I just think that's cool. And I had a really great intro geology professor, you know, who was really excited about the subject and, and he just made it sort of come alive and I was hooked. Did you know that you were going to go to graduate school or was that a decision that you made later? How, how did you make that decision? Uh, it was sort of a decision that was made along the way. Um, you know, as you get a degree in geology, there the, a lot of the options are, are sort of, you know, environmental or oil um, or grad school. And I wasn't so much interested in, in the oil companies that were trying to recruit us. Um, and, and I, I really, again, just, you know, had, had discovered this field of planetary geology. And there's not really an, anything you can do with a, without a PhD if you want to be a planetary geologist. So that there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, once I've decided that was my path, grad school was sort of inevitable. Okay, so so you knew that once you decided you wanted to be a planetary geologist, then it was it was like okay, then I have to get a PhD, so I'm going to do this. Pretty much. Okay, how did you decide on where to go to get your PhD, and how did you find your advisor? Uh, so I did an internship my last year as an undergrad. I did a, a summer internship down at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. Um, I worked with um, a, a scientist at, at Johnson Space Center studying meteorites, um, and that was my sort of first introduction to actual research, right? And, and as I sort of started un- under- began to understand what research is about and what it's like to do research, uh, I got introduced to a lot of scientists there, um, and, and I actually came back and, and presented that work at a, at a conference and got introduced to, to a lot more people there, too. And my advisor was very good about sort of introducing me around to, to the people in the community. And that's where I sort of learned, you know, talking to people about where, where are the good schools, um, you know, talking to other, to, to other students about, you know, what, what do you like about your advisor? What do you, what do you not like? Um, and I sort of gathered a list and, and you know went to the few people that I knew in the field and asked them, what do you think of this person? What do you think of that person? And that's where I sort of narrowed things down. Did you encounter any struggles uh, as you were going in to get your PhD or as you were earning it for research funding? I did not. I was actually pretty uh, pretty lucky in that sense. Uh, my advisor had money uh, for me uh, at times. Sometimes I, I TA'd. Uh, taught classes to, to get to earn my keep. And sometimes I had my own money and did, got to do research uh, full time. I actually got a NASA fellowship uh, about halfway through that covered me pretty much full time for the last half of my uh, thesis, which was really nice because I didn't have to TA anymore and didn't have to worry about things. And I could really focus on my own research. Um, which is good. I actually now run that program for NASA, which is fantastic. So I get to now help other people in the same way, which is a little bit, a little full circle. Oh yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It is. It's great. And so I I didn't have too many struggles, um, dealing with money. Um, but you, you do watch the, you know, people around you, um, you know, my advisor was always concerned about, am I going to have enough money? And she always did, but you know, it's a, it's a kind of a scary world. 
Right. So thinking back to that time, if if there's somebody listening to, to this who's thinking about, you know, doing their master's or PhD in, in some area of geology, would you have any specific recommendations for them? Yes, I would talk to uh, talk to um, the other students of the of the people that you are interested in working for uh, and get a, get asked them a lot of questions about what it's like to work for that person. Um, no advisor is perfect, uh, but you have to find somebody who has quirks that you can live with. <laughs> so, so uh, talk to their former students and investigate what those quirks are. <laughs> Could could you elaborate on that a little bit? I I mean I've I've witnessed it as I've seen some other friends go for their PhD. You know some some advisors can be really hands on, some can be really hands off. Could you just speak a little bit to you know for a student um, maybe the self awareness that they need to recognize who would be a good fit for them? Yeah, that's that's totally true. The point you make about hands on versus hands off. My advisor was was fairly hands off, but really good about you know her door was always open. She was always there if you if you approached her and and wanted to talk and needed help. But she was not likely to you know check up on you and make sure you know be, stand in your office door and make sure things were getting done. And so I had a lot of rope with which I could have hung myself, <laughs> right. um, you know, and so, and, and not everybody does well with that, but, you know, on the other hand, I had friends whose advisor, you know, was constantly in their doorway and constantly, you know, looking over their shoulder and, and, you know, demanding things and having endless meetings with them. And, and that works for some people and it doesn't work for others. And so I think it's, it's, you know, somebody told me once when I was looking for an advisor to think of it like a marriage, you're essentially attached to this person for, you know, six years of your life and it better be somebody that you can get along with and work with on a, on a regular basis. So, you know, it's, it's worth the time. I, you know, I see people come in and go, I really want to work on this project. So, so I need to have this person as my advisor. And I'm like, don't worry about the project, worry about the advisor and what kind of relationship you're going to have. It's much more important. Yeah, I think I think that's good advice. So you would say <laughs> even more important than the subject matter of the research, you you think it's more important to have the advisor that works well for you so that you get out of get out of it what you need, right? That's right. Cool. Okay. Um so you got a position, I read a congressional staffer position with the US Committee uh, on science, space, and technology. Is that the first thing that you did after earning your PhD? Yeah, it was straight out of grad school. I actually had a, a postdoc lined up uh, with NASA down at Johnson Space Center, but I deferred it for a year because uh, that I, this opportunity came up. And so it's a program run by uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and they've been doing it now for, I think, 35 years, maybe, maybe more. 40 years? It's been a while. Yeah, maybe 40 years, um, where they bring in um, scientists from, from all sorts of fields, um, engineering, you know, psychology, chemistry, physics, biology, I mean, you name it, um, and for a year to, to work on the Hill, to work in um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Office of State, all throughout government. We even have a couple at, at NASA headquarters. Um, and you're essentially, you know, free to, to your, to the, to Congress or to, to the agency, um, you're free labor for them for a year and, and you get to sort of see sort of inside the process. And so I was lucky enough to be put with the, the house science committee, uh, with the space subcommittee. So I really was interested in sort of the policy side of space. Uh, and I got a really good chance to sort of see inside, uh, how the, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Uh, worked on the staff. I, I worked for the, the minority staff at the time. The, the Republicans were in charge, and I worked for the, the Democratic staff, um, which was also an experience. But it meant that the staff was really small. The entire space subcommittee staff was just me and my boss. And so I got to really work on whatever it was I was interested in. I got to write speeches. I got, you know, write questions for, for the congressmen, uh, you know, help out running hearings. It was a fantastic experience. Okay, tell us more about this because it's it's really difficult to imagine. Like I'm I'm thinking about you know this place where 
politicians are working and people are in suits, but what exactly is everyone doing and and what did you what did you help with specifically? Um so a lot of what the committee staff does is um help the congressmen prepare for for and hold hearings on on various topics and help them write legislation. So so if there was going to be, you know, a hearing coming up on, you know, space, some space related topic, uh, my boss and I would, would sit down and we'd write out questions, you know, that the, that the congressman could ask. Right. So that during the hearing, we sit there during the hearing and, and help them, you know, make sure that they are prepared and, and you know, look good during the meeting, <laughs> during the hearing. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, we help them if they want to write up legislation. Um, we work with them to, to sort of get that written up. Um, uh, if they are going to go onto the floor and try and, you know, talk on the floor about something, you know, um, we help them write speeches for that. Um, and then we work with um, the committee, uh, the other side of the committee as well, uh, to, to negotiate what, what kind of legislation is going to look like. And then you, then you can got to negotiate with the Senate side of the House uh, of the of the, of the capital and, and, and work out differences between your version and their version. And, uh, it's a lot of, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a real, it's sort of inside the world bubble world. You get to, you get to sort of glimpse in, uh, I was only there for, for a year. So, you know, just, you, it takes about a year to figure out what you're doing in that job. So <laughs> I sort of felt like I had no clue what was going on until the very end. And then I left, which is too bad, but I did get sort of a taste of everything. You know, I got to write, I actually wrote some, uh, you know, parts of, of, of a bill that got passed the, the 2005, um, space authorization act. There's actually like about a page and a half of the 200 page document I wrote, which is pretty cool in law. Very cool. <laughs> so, so so you know, it was it was a it was a fantastic experience. It was so different from academia, um, you know, in grad school life um, it, it, that it was it sort of really changed my perspective on things. You know, it, the the timing of you know it, everything has to happen an instant. You know, you don't have weeks or months to mull things over like you do in grad school. Um, and so it was it was a really fascinating experience. But I did ultimately miss science. Uh, and decided that maybe politics wasn't the place I necessarily belonged. Right. Okay. So you you did go do the postdoc at NASA after that. And so was that kind of like going back to your PhD and back to the to similar research? It was. Yeah. That was very much the same kind of research that I had been doing uh, during my during my PhD and 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 pin- finishing up a lot of the projects, writing up the projects from my from my PhD. Um, and it was it was cool and it was fun, uh, but then I got bored doing that too, <laughs> and, and so I tried. I, I did a two year postdoc at, at Johnson Space Center doing research, and then there's an opportunity if you do a NASA postdoc to to go to headquarters for a year and see what that side of the world is like. And so I did that um, and sort of explored how how things work from from the headquarters point of view. Um, you know, handing out the money instead of asking for it. Um, did you Which like it? I did. I actually really liked it. Um, but there was no opportunity at the time to stay. So then I went back to science briefly. Um, I actually went to a different NASA center. I went to NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and continued doing research for a little while. But um, it's about two years later, they actually found a position at headquarters. Well, sort of. They found a position at, at NASA Goddard and then detailed me to headquarters. It's very convoluted. I have toured all of the NASA centers. Right, so, okay. So, so I was actually, a, I became a NASA Goddard employee specifically so that they could detail me to NASA headquarters. And that's where I started my headquarters career. Um, and then eventually I got a permanent position at headquarters. So now I'm at headquarters permanently. Okay, well, let, let's go backwards for just a second. Um, talk to us about the research that you did for your PhD and your postdoc. What did you specialize in? Uh, moon dust, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds awesome. How, how did that happen? So um, my advisor uh, is, you know, one of the, you know, original like lunar scientists out there, right? And so she sort of pushed me towards the moon. Um, but she's mostly a remote sensing type. She does a lot of spectroscopy, uh, and that's sort of where I started. But um, a lot of my work sort of evolved into more studies of the samples themselves 
And so I started doing a lot of research down at, at Johnson Space Center, um, looking at moon dust through very big microscopes, <laughs> essentially. Uh -huh. um, electron microscopes, SEMs, TEMs. So you could sort of see things down to the nanometer scale. And sort of my, my niche was sort of trying to, to, to look at the spectra, you know, that we get from remote sensing from, you know, the far away and connect it to what we can see uh, in these tiny grains at a nanometer scale. So I'm like connecting kilometers to nanometers, essentially, uh, and trying to understand how space weathering affects the, the surface of the moon, how the moon evolves over time. Um, so if you notice, like if you look at the moon and you see that, that some of the craters have these sort of bright ray systems, right, and other craters don't. Um, and so it turns out that the, bra the bright rays are young, right, so they've excavated fresh material and that material is very bright. And so you get these bright rays, but then over time it turns dark. And so I basically study the process by which the moon gets darker. Okay, so... Explain space weathering. Like I, I read this in in some of your stuff, and I, I don't know what it means, but from what you just said, it sounds like it it means weathering, like a rock gets weathered. Is it like that? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people often confuse it with space weather, which is a different thing. Um, <laughs> okay. Than, <laughs> than people worry about, but they are somewhat related. So space weathering is basically everything that happens if you don't have an atmosphere to protect you, right? So the moon, also Mercury, a lot of the smaller moons of other planets, asteroids, anything that doesn't have an atmosphere to protect you is constantly bombarded by by tiny little micrometeorites. Uh, as well as by particles from the solar wind and like galactic and cosmic rays and all sorts of things. And uh, they all play the part in, in, in changing the optical properties of the surface. Very cool. Okay. All right. So what would you say is the most difficult part about getting published? Because this is a big piece, you know, for, for people who go to graduate school. Um, actually sitting down and writing. <laughs> that is personally for me the hard part. Like the actual doing of the science is fun and exciting, right? But then, and you learn all sorts of cool stuff and it's great to like talk about it, but then to actually sit down and put words to paper and put it and get it into a form to get published is, is a very, is really hard for me. Something I struggle with a lot. That's funny. So do you, do you still have many uh, publication requirements of you now? Uh, not really, no. I, I actually still, when I when I took the permanent position at headquarters, I actually worked out a deal that I do still sort of occasionally get to do research. So it's something like like 10 or 15% of my job is research. Um, and so I do occasionally still have to publish things, but um, it's not, it's more of a hobby these days, <laughs> okay. to be honest. All right. So nobody, it's not, nobody's really judging me on whether I'm getting things published or not other than myself. Cause I do have like, I do have like seven papers that really should get published. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what some of those are about. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, well, the one that I am, uh, it, the one that I'm most recently working on that I really feel like I shouldn't until I get the other six done. <laughs> but <laughs> of course, what you're doing most recently is the one you're excited about, right? Um, is the stuff that I've been doing lately is, is taking a look at um, actually not moon dust, but rather moon rocks, right? So moon rocks also weather too. They're sitting out there getting exposed uh, and they get hit by, by, tiny micro, by, by tiny little meteorites all the time. And, and they make these tiny little holes um, that are, you know, microns across, sometimes even, you know, nanometers across um, in the rocks. And, and we're trying to understand what that process is and, and how each of those little micrometeorites, you know, sort of erodes the, the rocks or doesn't or changes the, the properties of, of the surface of the rocks. And so we actually have a, a cool um, instrument suite down at, at Johnson Space Center where we can go in and, and basically take a cross section through one of those tiny little craters, so the 10 micron across crater. So, you know, for reference, a, a strand of your hair is maybe, you know, 40 microns across. Oh, so wow. this crater is, is like 10 microns across, right? It's very, very small. And we can actually slice it in half and take a look at, at what's going on, the layers of the crater and how the crater formed and how deep it melted and, and what was going on inside those craters. And so that's what I've been doing lately. Uh, and we've been doing it in different, ki different kinds of minerals to see what the effects of, of, the, of the different chemistries are. 
um, and trying to understand that, that process. Um, and the, the pictures are just amazing and beautiful. And it's like really incredible that we have the technology to be able to do this on that scale. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell us something really cool about the moon that most people wouldn't know. Oh, wow. Um, I have no idea. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, let's see, we've got, um, we, we currently have three spacecraft in orbit around the moon. I did not know that. Uh-huh. <laughs> there, there you go. Um, and we had recently, there were two others though. At one point, um, not that long ago, we actually had five spacecraft around the, around the moon at one time, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, so can they did, can they bring those back? Like, did those two others come back, or what happens? No, we 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 use them as as impact tests, right? So we, <laughs> we they, they finish their um, and and actually so so um, the the Grail spacecraft, um, which let's see, it was up there in 2010, 11. I think it, they, we impacted it in 12. I think. Um, it was actually two tiny little spacecraft. They were like the size of like a dorm refrigerator. They were just tiny little things. Um, and we, and we've, you know, we impact them in. And so we've got another spacecraft up there that's taken a high resolution picture. picture. So it goes around and it actually has photographed the site before and after. So you can see where the impacts are. Um, so they basically crash and then you so take pictures. Crash. Yeah. And we take pictures, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then the Laddie spacecraft, which was mine, I was the, the, the program scientist for that mission, crashed in, well, I shouldn't say crashed. The, the, the press people always got very upset with me when I said crashed. Impacted, because it was intentional. Right, right. <laughs> right. Impacted um, a couple, like, in 2014. Wasn't that long ago. Okay, um, so where, yeah. which, which NASA site were you at when you, when you worked on this Laddie? project uh so that was at headquarters so i was the the program scientist so for every mission we have there's somebody there's a scientist at headquarters who is in charge of sort of uh coordinating with the science team so i'm like the liaison between headquarters and the scientists okay so talk to us more about that so this this program scientist role what are what are the responsibilities like and and so it's it's um a position that happens every time there's a craft that goes into outer space, right? Yep, yep. Every 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 mission, you know, starting from the time you know it becomes a mission, um, has a has a program scientist. They are uh, in charge of defining and ensuring the level one science requirements. That's that's NASA E's for like we are the ones who protect the science, right? So we've decided we're going to send this mission somewhere. Now the engineers have to build it. And we are there to make sure that that you know that science has a voice and, and that the engineers don't screw things up so that the the scientists aren't going to get the data they need, right? And so we follow along with the mission, making sure that it's built properly um, and that the scientists have what they need. And then we're also sort of there to make sure that the scientists are doing their jobs too. That like once it gets built and and you know the, the data starts coming back, the scientists are actually taking care of that data and, and getting it uh, put into the data system so that other scientists can look at it and, you know, make sure that they're actually doing the, the science that takes the data and turns it into science, right? And so we are sort of, we're, we're there to ensure both sides, that the scientists have what they need and also that they're delivering what they promised. That's really awesome. So did you have to compete to get that role? Um, not exactly. So there's, you know, we're, we're a fairly small group at headquarters and, and most of us have a couple of missions, um, that we're in charge of at any given time. At the moment, I'm the, I'm now that Laddie is done, no longer my responsibility, but I'm now the deputy for the Mars 2020 rover, um, which is launching in 2020. So it's our next big rover to Mars. So there's a bunch of, you know, there's, there's always more work to do than people to do it. Right. And so, so what happens is, you know, a mission will come up and we're hopefully about to select, um, a new mission or two pretty soon. Um, and that w it will get handed out to whoever is most appropriate for it. So right now we're competing, um, a discovery class mission, which is our smallest class of mission. And they've narrowed it down to five different projects, right? Two of them are going to Venus. Um, there's one that's a, a telescope, an orbiting telescope to look for, um, small asteroids and things. Um, 
let's see, there's one that's going out to Trojan asteroids, uh, and there's one that's going to a, a, a main belt asteroid that they think is made out of metal, which is super cool, right? And so we're going to pick between these, these, five, these five missions, right? And at least one, maybe two of them will get selected. Um, and then depending on, you know, who, is, who, who on our science team is most appropriate for the science, um, they'll get that, right? And so, you know, if it's Venus, it's probably not going to be me because I don't do Venus, <laughs> right? right. So, so depending on which ones get picked, I actually, I'm not going to say, but I do actually have my eye on one of the missions. And if that one gets selected, then I'm going to go and, and fight to, to get that mission because I really want it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it, it's sort of where you work it out within the team um, who has the time and the and the background for it for, uh, to handle that mission. Okay, so I want to come back to the Mars 2020 thing in, in just a minute. But first, um, is there anything in, in your career path, like your timeline, that we kind of skipped over that, that we should talk about? No, I think we covered it. Did we? Okay, I didn't know if we covered everything <laughs> on the. It's it's complicated. No, nobody's re, nobody's career is a straight line. People right. Are like, oh, you you know, you're such an inspiration, right? I I should, you know, I want to understand your career path, and I'm like, no, don't take my career path. <laughs> like, it's well, not what, the way to go. <laughs> what makes you say that? I mean, it maybe it was windy or something, but I mean, it's obviously really good. So, what makes you say that? It is. It, I, I mean, it is windy. And, and, you know, and I don't, I actually, I, I shouldn't say that because I don't regret any of the, the, the jobs that I've held or the positions that I've been in because they, they were all great learning experiences. Um, and they have all taught me a lot of different things, uh, which are applicable in my current position that I didn't necessarily realize would be right. So, uh, you know, almost all experience is good experience even when they were bad experiences at the time. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So you, what is your responsibility now with the, with Mars 2020? So, so Mars is at Mars 2020 is, is, is a really big mission. So we actually have two people at headquarters, um, that are the scientists. So, so, um, Mitch Schulte is the, is the program scientist for it. And I'm his deputy, um, which means I'm sort of the backup there to make sure that that you know if he can't make it to all the the meetings or whatever that there's somebody else that's got his back and and can step in um, if he can't be there. Um, it's a it's an enormous mission. It's it, you know compared to to Laddie, which was my first mission as a as a program scientist. Right, that was a very small mission. It was you know it's a three month long uh, prime mission. It had you know three instruments on it. And, you know, and almost nobody was paying any attention to it. Whereas Mars 2020 is, you know, a multi-billion dollar mission. It's got, I think, seven, eight instruments, um, you know, several hundred people, science team. um, And it's it's got a lot of people are are watching it closely. And so it's a it's sort of different scale of of mission. And so um, it, it, it requires two of us to keep track of everything that's going on. Okay, so what what exactly is going to happen? Is it going to be like like sending another Curiosity over there? It, in a lot of ways, it is. It's very. It's sort of designed um, to fit on the same um, chassis as as Curiosity. So it's got the same landing system, and it, and if you see pictures of them side to side, they they are you know practically twins. They look very similar, but the instruments on it are a little bit different, and its purpose is a little bit different. Um, some of the instruments are sort of you know, better versions of, of what was on Curiosity because, you know, we have, we, we, ha- we practiced on Curiosity and we figured out what was good and what was bad and we have been able to improve on those things. Uh, but some of the instruments are completely different, uh, brand new. And the main thing that's different is that um, we are caching samples. So there's a drilling system on there that will allow us to, to, to create drill cores and store them away so that another future mission down the road could actually bring them back to Earth so we can have samples on Earth that we that we have investigated and we know what they are. Okay, so how how does your your lunar expertise translate to w- working on on Mars stuff? <laughs> well, not very well, but Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, like, like, like most planetary scientists, right? I don't, I don't just have lunar expertise, right? We, we, I, you know, I've worked on on the moon, I've worked on Mercury, on asteroids, on Mars before, right? And so we tend to spread ourselves around the around the solar system. I call myself a lunar geologist, but it's not actually true. I have worked, um, I've worked on lots of places 
um, across the solar system, just because, like I said before, we all start out as sort of terrestrial geologists, as, as, as traditional, you know, Earth geologists, and then apply that um, to other planets. And so, you know, once you start, once you understand the rules, you can pretty much apply the rules anywhere, right? You just have to pay attention to, to the different constraints. Okay, very cool. Thank you for joining us today for episode 13 of the STEM XM podcast. We're joined today by Sarah Noble, planetary geologist and lunar scientist from NASA. All right, so what else are you working on now that you're excited about? Um, so a lot of what I do for, for NASA is, is grant management. So I run, um, besides run, besides working on these missions, I run a lot of programs like I was talking about, the Graduate School Student Fellowship Program. But I also run a lot of programs where um, I get to you know, pick the best science uh, and fund the, the best scientists. And so I run a program um, called, uh, they're all terrible acronyms. NASA loves their acronyms, right? So I run a program called PDART the Planetary Data Archiving Restoration and Tools Program, um, which is not terribly exciting, but terribly important uh, stuff where, where you can um, go to, to archive data that, that somehow didn't get into our system otherwise. Um, and so that's a great, I mean, it's not necessarily cool, the coolest thing in the world, but it is really important um, and critical to do. So I'm very proud of that program. And then the other program I run is called PSTAR, which is Planetary Science and Technology Through Analog Research. Uh, which is kind of really cool stuff. There's uh, people who are um, going out to places on the Earth that are analogs to um, places on, on Mars or the Moon or, you know, Europa or whatever. And so there are people who are doing testing of, of instruments or, or operational procedures for, you know, missions to, missions to Mars, missions to, to Europa. And they, they go out and, you know, bring their rovers and their, and their drills and their, you know, underwater, you know, or, or flying over whatever uh, places in, you know, Iceland or um, where, where do you say, the Atacama Desert or all over the world um, to sort of test things out and figure out how they're going to do this on another planet. That sounds like a really cool job. It is a fantastic job. <laughs> what do you have to do to get into that? <laughs> So, yeah, um, that's a good question. I think I have stumbled here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so P-Dart and P-Star. If I yeah. Google that, I can find some stuff, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, I will put links to um, some of that in the show notes and definitely some info on uh, Mars 2020. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Tell us about you a little bit. What do you do to unwind and, and relax from your day? Uh, so I have a sort of second life as, a, as an artist. I do. I spend a lot of my free time painting. And what types of things do you paint? I'm guessing landscapes. I, I, yeah, actually, mostly like lunar landscapes. Yeah, it's mostly the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think do you think you'll start shifting to Mars maybe? <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, you're actually not the first person to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I love I love all the planets. The planets are all beautiful and, and I and I do spend time painting all of them, but none of them are as beautiful as the moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, that's so funny. So is it is it difficult for you now that there's like so much interest in in Mars and maybe, you know, getting a manned mission to Mars and maybe the moon's not getting as much attention? <laughs> you know, these things, they, they, they go back and forth and, and, you know, around and around. And, and not that Mars, I mean, Mars is a fantastic place. And I, I think we all agree that at some point we do need to send humans to Mars. Um, what the correct steps to get there are see, seem to keep changing and I expect they will continue to change. But you know what, there's all sorts of interesting places along the way. Um, the moon is one, asteroids are another, uh, the moons of Mars. There's, there's, we have no shortage of, of cool places to go in the solar system. So I, I think whichever path NASA decides is the right one, um, we'll, f we'll find cool science to do along the way. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Do you have any thoughts on SpaceX? Um, yeah, I think that they are fantastic and I wish them luck. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, cool. Okay, so uh, I want I want to ask you before we wrap up. Um, can you give advice, like some general thoughts, um, on to some young people who are, might be interested in going down a path in geology, or maybe specifically planetary geology? What would you say to you know young college you? What do, what do you wish you know knew then that you know now? Oof. Um... I think you should. I think you should follow your passion. You know, whatever you're interested in, um, and I think you should get to know people. The you know, my path I said was windy, right? But most of the opportunities I've had in my career have been because I knew somebody, and they knew that I was interested, and and just gave my name to somebody else. You know, it was it's it's all you know, it's all it's like showbiz, right? It's all about who you know. And same is true of, of just about any academic field, right? It's all about who you know. And so the, the best way to, to, you know, get out there and, and get to know people is to, you know, um, I did an internship. That's a fantastic way. But you can, you can actually, you know, cold call people too. Send them, an, send them an email. You read their paper and you thought it was interesting. People love to hear that, that you like their paper. So, you know, and get to know people. Go to conferences and introduce yourself. You know, stand at somebody's paper and ask the poster and ask them questions. Um, the more people you know, um, the, the easier you will find your path. Absolutely. That's, that's really great advice. Oh man, so this is really cool. I've I've learned several things. Um, that's that's about the end of my questions. So I just want to open it up to you. If there's any you know general advice that you might want to give, maybe even specifically to women going into STEM or women that are going into science, maybe in particular being interested in in NASA. Do you have any thoughts for them? You know, it's it's not necessarily the easiest road to hoe, and my best advice is to find other women. We um, we do every year at the uh, at our big you know annual conference, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. We always have a, a women's event where we you know just invite women together. Um, sometimes we have speakers, and sometimes we just sit around a table and t- and talk to each other about various issues, whatever. And we've been doing it forever. And I remember when I was a grad student and we would do it and it would be, you know, half a dozen women in somebody's hotel room, um, you know, trading war stories. And, and now we, you ha- we have the big ballroom and we fill it. And, you know, every time, every time I see, you know, as I, every year as I see the women sort of start marching in and, and like talking to each other and, and, you know, and just the power of seeing, you know, hundreds of women, you know, all in the same field sitting around talking about how, you know, things, it, it's so, it's such a difference just to know that you're, you're not alone. You're not one of the few, um, to be able to, to sit around with people of your, of your kind, uh, and talk about things, um, is a fantastic opportunity. And so I encourage you to, to see, seek out people. There are lots of groups like that. The, the association for women geoscientists, um, is another one if you're interested in geology, um, it really helps to, to know that there are other women out there and that we are struggling with a lot of the same issues. Um, that alone is enough to, to make the burden a little easier. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. What organization hosts the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference? Strangely enough, there isn't one. It is the, it is the strange conference that doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a parent uh, parents yeah it is it evolved in a strange way from the, the the lunar science conference that happened um in you know this the 1970 when the first moon rocks came back um and it doesn't really have a, a parent organization we have a strange community <laughs> that's very funny okay well i'll i'll look it up anyway we'll we'll get it into the show notes and and certainly i'll put a link also to the association for women geoscientists so. The, the the division for planetary sciences does the same thing actually of the uh, American Astronomical Society. Okay, great, excellent. I'll I'll be sure to put uh, links to those in there as well. Yeah, perfect. All right, well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us, and 
I, I mean, I had no idea that through geology you could get into you know, such cool work at NASA. So that that is so amazing. This It's just a great career path that you've had. And uh, we certainly look forward to seeing what you do in the future and what happens with Mars 2020. Thank you very much. I happen to agree that it is the most awesome job ever. <laughs> what an amazing woman and career. I learned so much from talking to Sarah. I just had no idea there was such an interesting and unique avenue into NASA through geology. And as Sarah said at the beginning, there are many different specialty areas of geology that can lead to a variety of stimulating and rewarding careers. All right, so I've got show notes ready for you in the usual place. You can find those at stemxm.com slash episode 13. That's stemxm.com forward slash and then episode and the number 13. In this episode's show notes, you'll find links to the missions and work that Sarah has led or been involved with at NASA, like the Lottie mission and Mars 2020, as well as PDART and PSTAR. I also put links to the Lunar and Planetary Institute, the Division for Planetary Sciences, which is part of the American Astronomical Society, and the Association for Women Geoscientists. We didn't uh, mention this on the show, but Sarah is on Twitter, so if you have questions you'd like to submit to her directly, head on over to the show notes and you'll find a link to her Twitter account. Stay tuned for episode 14, and I'll catch you there. This has been an episode of the STEM XM podcast. Thank you for listening. We would really love if you could pop over to iTunes and give us an honest, positive rating. It helps more listeners find us to learn about STEM careers. Thanks again. Cheers. And we'll catch you on the next episode.